Okay, hi. I am Dr. Stacy Carmichael. I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I own MindWork Psychological Services in Winter Garden and Dr. Phillips, and I specialize in autism diagnostic evaluations, and in particular, girls in the autism spectrum. And I'm here today with um, Lee Palmer Moffitt, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi. Yes, as she said, I'm Lee Palmer Moffitt. I'm a homeschooling mom to two girls on the spectrum. I'm an autism advocate, blogger, and I work to help families with understanding, accepting, and celebrating their neurodiversity through my social media platforms. That's it. <laughs> and we both have self-identified as probably being on the spectrum, and, and I also have a 21, almost 21-year-old son on the spectrum. Yeah. So, very familiar, and we love to talk about this topic. So we, we wanted to give this presentation for parents who are wondering if maybe their girl or a boy might have subtle high-functioning autism that has been missed. And we want to tell you what that might look like, some of the signs and symptoms, um, things that we've gone through, things that the research says, and you know um, why you would go through an evaluation and how it can help you. Okay, so I would like to talk about you know, famous women on the autism spectrum because what we traditionally see in society is men on the autism spectrum. We've got Netflix with Atypical. We've got um, The Good Doctor on MD, uh, NBC. We've mm -hmm. got Sheldon on, what is that one? That one Big is Bang Big Bang Theory. Yeah. And, you know, years ago, we, we've got Rain Man, and they're all men, and we really don't have any idea of what a woman on the spectrum looks like, other than Temple Grandin, I think, is probably the one that most people would think about, who mm -hmm. is a professor of animal sciences at Colorado State, and a huge autism advocate. If you ever get a chance to see her, I highly recommend it. She's phenomenal. Some other women on the autism spectrum that are less well-known... Uh, I'm kind of in the, my picture's in the way there. Haley Moss, um, you've heard of Haley? Yes, yes, I absolutely love Haley. Um, I follow her on Instagram. I saw when she was admitted to the bar and, you know, shared that with my daughter and she was so excited to see this young female, this young autistic female um, being admitted to the bar here in Florida. And, um, and she actually, you know, she... She wrote the foreword for a really awesome book that my girls love. Um, it used to be All Cats Have Asperger's and it was changed to All Cats Are on the Autism Spectrum and she wrote the foreword for it. And um, I immediately bought it and like, it's it's a really great book. Um, so yeah, she's super sweet. She's a heroine and, and even though she, they say she is the first uh, female on the spectrum admitted to the Florida bar, that's probably not true. I it's would, the first we know about. The first that we know about. I, I'm sure that there's many more. We, we just don't know. So um, thinking about some other people in the autism spectrum, Dawn Prince Hughes is um, an anthropologist, primatologist, worked at the Jane Goodall Institute. Emily Dickinson, people probably don't think about her being on the spectrum. Cheryl <laughs> Hannah, an actress from a long time ago. She was in Splash, but then she never would never do any interviews because she was shy and she rocked. And um, she has talked about her difficulties uh, um, performing outside of movies due to being on the autism spectrum. Gosh, 10, 11 years ago, Susan Boyle was on uh, Britain's Got Talent. <laughs> She's on the autism spectrum. I don't know if people remember her. Courtney Love. Mm -hmm. Anna Williams, um, who wrote the book, Nobody Nowhere. Again, she was diagnosed back when it was called childhood schizophrenia and, you know, recommended to be institutionalized. And she really ha had a lot of trauma and a rough time growing up. Um, so, you know, kudos, kudos to her. And more recently, uh, you might've heard of Hannah Gadsby. She's a comedian who has a special on Netflix, which is really hilarious. And she talks about her trials and tribulations <laughs> growing up on the autism spectrum and not really thinking like the other kids in her school um, mm -hmm. thought. So she's, she, I wanted to play a clip of her video here, but it's, the language is not appropriate, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to watch it. Hannah Gadsby, uh, Google her. There's, she has a little spoof about prepositions and how she does not understand them in school. Yeah. Okay. 
I got to figure out how to move my, there we go. Um, I cannot play this. If you, if you go on YouTube, um, I forgot the name of this, but it's, it's a series of beautiful women talking about their autism diagnosis and how they're told they didn't look like they had autism. Um, there's, there's their moms, um, a lot of them, they're actresses, they're successful, they've struggled, they've had to overcome quite a bit. Um, the autism diagnosis has given them um, a lot of relief, a sense of validity. And it's mm -hmm. really interesting. Uh, one of the moms is as she talks, she's sitting there and she's rocking back and forth. And she says that, you know, she's got a couple of children on the spectrum and then she was identified as being on the spectrum. So I imagine it was probably quite a different difficult existence for her to grow up not knowing that she was also on right. Her. Yeah. Right. So go I, common. I, it's super common. It is super common. So I encourage you to watch that. We won't play that here because I can't. Okay. I'm going to read you. So this is a very typical presentation. I'm going to read you about Maya. This is from the article Lost Girls by Apovora Mendevelli. And, and this is a story that I see all the time. Um, very, very common presentation. It takes hours to see glimpses of the pain Maya has endured over the years. She makes eye contact. She pokes fun at herself. And she takes turns in conversations, things that people with autism are generally not uh, known to have trouble doing. She dresses like other teens. She's chatty and no one would guess by looking at her that she has autism. She's proud of her accomplishments and rightly so. She excelled at school. She could read fluently by age five and she began reading four to five books a week. She was lead violinist at her school and she can play the piano and the viola. She taught herself to play the clarinet, and after only nine months of lessons, she performed a Mozart concerto at her school. What you wouldn't know is that at age four, she had severe separation anxiety. She screamed every time strangers entered her nursery school. Later, at her all-girls school, she sat by herself at playtime. and She read everywhere, even on stage at her cousin's wedding. She struggled with small talk, regularly making a social faux pas, such as blurting out the ending to a mystery novel, or reciting divorce statistics at an engagement party. And she rambled on and on about her interest so long, her mother devised a secret gesture, a tap on the watch, to signal her to stop. Any small disruption in her routine, dinner on the table 10 minutes later than promised, a late appointment, her little brother sitting in her favorite chair could ruin her week. She rarely slept and she had horrible nightmares. She turned down invitations to aimless social activities such as shopping. And she called out the other girls when they broke school rules, potentially uh, turning friends into enemies. By the time she was eight, she was bullied so much at school that she became sick with anxiety every Sunday night. Her parents switched schools, but she was bullied there too. And even including on the 45 minute bus trip each way. As she got older, the bullying became more vicious. One girl told her the world would be a better place if she wasn't in it and that she felt sorry for her parents. Ever honest, Maya believed her. She thought that she wouldn't say things unless they were true. So why would that girl? When she was 12, Maya began secretly cutting herself. Like many girls with autism at this age, she was acutely aware of all the ways in which she was being excluded by her peers. She became very depressed. Soon she became obsessed with controlling her weight. Like many other adolescent girls with autism, she developed an eating disorder a pastime that was related to her love of numbers and her desire for perfection. After a psychiatric consultation, she emerged with several diagnoses, including oppositional defiant disorder, anorexia, bipolar with psychotic features, anxiety, OCD, ADHD, and depression. And this is a very common presentation for particularly um, for a, a, an older teenager or young adult on the spectrum or Absolutely. an older adult. Yeah. 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 And, you know, this, this is definitely um, not necessarily all of those same diagnoses with my daughter, but getting my eldest diagnosed, um, you know, taking her to different people or even just getting, just getting a pediatrician in the first place to see that, hey, there, there are these things going on with her, um, very difficult. And she ended up with a slew of diagnoses that 
you know, these could be there, but you're completely missing the root cause. And um, that's just, I, I, I see it so frequently with parents who are just so, so overwhelmed and struggling and especially with their daughters going like, well, yeah, you know, she has anxiety and she has OCD and she has ADHD and she has this and this and this. And, and, and then I get around these girls and I'm, I'm just sitting there going, they're autistic. <laughs> like that's what's going on here. Right. And professional, I know I, professionals mean well, I think they just, they don't understand. They don't understand the presentation. They don't understand what autism looks like. Years ago, they didn't even understand what autism looked like. And I struggled getting my son who's, who's um, more typically, and I did ask him if I could talk about him in his <laughs> presentation. He said, mm -hmm. sure, mama, that's okay. But you know, I struggled getting him diagnosed. He was a very difficult baby. He um, um, was, it was hard to soothe him. You had to constantly be bouncing him, uh, rocking him. He couldn't self entertain any sensory uh, thing, set him off lights, noise, couldn't go to the mall, changing his diapers. He screamed, trying new food. He screamed, um, mm -hmm. clothing. He's, I mean, it was, <laughs> I was stressed out. And I, I remember telling one of my supervisors at, at the time and, and his response was, it's very easy to shake a baby. Right. And then I had, and I had, and as he aged, you know, I'm like, something's wrong. And the doctors would say to me, Stacy, why do you want something to be wrong with your son? Yeah. What? It's such a, it's such it a so load. I hear women tell me that all the time. And I, I get it. I hear you. I empathize. I have been there. Um, I have been told those same things and, uh, they, you know, they don't understand. So you have to go, you have to go to somebody who understands and has, you know, has lived it or knows, or, uh, you know, has the training in this area, because it is, it isn't something that you learn in school. It's something that you learn after and you, you, right. just, you just learn by doing it. So right. when you, find, when you're seeking a diagnosis for, for especially a girl in the spectrum or subtle autism, or if you have a slew of diagnosis, like Maya, Maya here, um, find somebody, you know, who, who, who understands and maybe we reading can... under, yeah reading behind the lines yeah. is yeah. what it is yeah you and know we'll, and this hopefully yeah. will give you a lot of ideas for you know the things to be on the lookout for and you know what what you can write down and take take into the doctor okay okay so this is the autism developmental disability monitoring network and they've been monitoring the progression of autism since the year 2000, you know, well, prior to that, gosh, when I was in grad school, it was, it was one in 10,000, I think in the eighties was the incidence of autism. And I was told, mm -hmm. you know, uh, watch, watch this kiddo in the clinic. You're never going to see this again. Um, in 1997, the incidence, I believe was one in 2,500. And look at the incidents here. The year 2000 is one in 50. 2006 is one in 110. 2010, it's one in 68. And then in 2016, which is the most recent data we have, it's one in 54. And that is 1.85% um, of eight-year-old boys are diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum or eight-year-olds, not eight-year-old boys, sorry, eight-year-olds. And the, the ratio for one in 54, the ratio breaks down to one in 54 boys and um, one in 144 girls. I Let me get the slide. Yeah, one in 144 girls. So for every girl identified as being on the spectrum, four boys were identified. And that 2016 data is off of my daughter's age. Yeah. kids born in 2008 so yeah she's in that she's in that one in 144 girls yeah and I can I can say it was that difficult <laughs> to get her diagnosed yeah. to get anyone to pay attention to anything with her and the data is a different it's it's different per state too so in Colorado the rate is one in 76 which mm -hmm. is 1.3 percent and in New Jersey it's one in 32 which is right 3.1% and you know I'm sure people have different conceptions as to what's going on in Jersey whether you know oh, that's a toxic waste dump or 
right. they have they have really good services in New Jersey and New York. So you know maybe people flock there. And yeah, I've definitely heard that um, in New York, people that in a, a autism group that I'm in, people will ask. Parents will go like, "Listen, we're looking at moving. What's the best state to be in?" Mm -hmm. And people go between California and New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So California has some good services too. This picture, this picture of this baby here staring at the sand and the beach that's my son <laughs> 20 20 years ago we went to the beach with, you know and there's the ocean and he's interested in the sand <laughs> so autism prevalence does appear to be modulated by the um the level of cognitive functionality so if your iq is below 70 which is in the range of intellectual disability the ratio tends to be there's one girl identified for every one boy identified and girls with low iq are more severe and they're picked up more now mm -hmm. if your iq is over 100 which is average an iq average an average iq is 100 the ratio of girls to boys identified is one to nine for every nine boys identified there's only one girl identified right yeah, yeah. It's, it's just crazy. So, you know, is that an actual true difference or is that, um, you know, a problem with di diagnostics? Um, I think it tends to be a problem with diagnostics. So a, a few studies, I don't even have them listed all here, show that in females, you know, even though parents express concerns developmentally for boys and girls at the same time, when the girls go in, they're like, mm, nah, that's not autism. The boys get diagnosed with autism. So the girls get in, get diagnosed with autism two years later or more than the boys, mm -hmm. even with the same level of symptoms. And I like these pictures. This is Leo Kanner, who first back in 1944 started describing kids on the autism spectrum. He talked about, I believe it was seven boys and three girls on the spectrum. And over here on the right, in 1944, Hans Osberger mm -hmm. identified four boys on the spectrum who enjoy talking about the train tables and he called them little professors and they would just talk at you about their interests. And what's interesting, mm -hmm. I, I had read about Leo Kanner, one of the girls um, often barked like a dog and you know that's how she communicated <laughs> with him. So I, having seen that in clinical practice lately, yeah. I thought that was pretty yeah. interesting that, that he wrote about that back in 1943. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I last did this presentation five years ago and not a lot has changed. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot more data, um, a little bit more, but there's not a whole lot more on sex differences in males and females. So the, the, the data that I have from 10 years ago, they studied 55,000 kids in South Korea, and they found the prevalence rate of autism to be 1.89%. And what we're finding here in the States right now is 1.85%. However, the male female ratio there is 2.5 to one. So I think it's, you know, is it really nine to one? Probably not. I think that we're missing a lot of the girls and it's probably right. two, two to one. If, if not even lower than that. And, and over there, they found intellectual disability in only 16% of their population. And it's interesting because the National Institute of Health does have an interagency for autism coordinating committee. And back there, even seven years ago, they noted that while autism is, does affect more males and females, they are aware that autism in females is probably underdiagnosed. Um, they recognize that there's different manifestations of autism in women. Um, they're not as disruptive. Um, they can recognize emotions more in facial expressions. And then ultimately what, what happens is they tend to mask or hide their symptoms and they're not getting, they're not getting diagnosed. And the question is, why would we want to diagnose them? Many reasons. And, you know, so, lots, yeah, lots so, of reasons, <laughs> you know, um, the understanding health, of themselves, uh, um, self-knowledge, yeah. uh, validating mm -hmm their symptoms, mm -hmm. that there's not something wrong with them, um, that there's a, there's a difference that explains it. Um, a lot of the girls in the having world, a why. Yeah, there's a why they, they often tell yeah. me that there's a sense of relief when mm -hmm. diagnosis, um, being able to 
being able to, you know, and this is this is something that um, I have frequently had conversations with a, a one of my younger sisters about. Um, you know, as you know, she was only recently diagnosed, and she, being twenty one years old, and this being done, um, there's still so much where she was just saying how she feels like she hasn't fully accepted this in her brain as yes this is legitimate and and I can stop you know badgering myself about things right. so things that she struggles with executive function struggles social skill struggles the reason that she feels so exhausted after she tries to go and you know hang out with friends or things like that like the reasons that she is the way she is um she struggles so frequently with not basically hating on herself and going why why you know why do i have to be like this and i'm lazy i've had so many conversations yeah i'm lazy with I'm her lazy just it. i'm not motivated right yeah and i've had so many conversations where you know she has said um that she shouldn't be like this you know, she shouldn't, I, I should be able to do this. I should be able to do this. I shouldn't be like that. And I just go, it's not about should. Mm -hmm. It's not about it. That's not even, that's not even a word that we need to discuss here. It's not about should. It's about, this is where I am. Right. This is what I'm capable of today. Just because you could do these things yesterday doesn't mean that's where you are today or where you'll be tomorrow. It's not about should. The and being able, yeah. Go ahead. Being able to look at yourself like that and and just accept. Exactly. This is where I am right now in this moment, and go. It's okay. That's a huge thing that you don't have without a diagnosis. That's really. You know? The cognitive behavior therapist would say you're shooting all over yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. It's, you have to remind her of that. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're going to talk about that and the evolution of autism and where have all these autistic people come from and were they there before and what's what's yeah. going on because it seems like there's an explosion of in the diagnosis and and it it really I think has to do with um, um, how they've changed the diagnostic labels over the years. It used to be called um, childhood schizophrenia. I think T Temple Grandin was diagnosed with that when she was really young. In 1980, yeah. the first time yeah. it was mentioned was in the DSM-3 as infantile autism, but they had all these, uh, you know, criteria that are set here and you had to be pretty significantly impaired right. in order to get a diagnosis. I mean, you were, you were rocking, you were echolalic, you were, you know, bizarre, there might be psychotic mm -hmm. episodes, things like that. So um i really like this chart i stole it from james um copeland in 2010 so it's a little bit old but it it shows why are we capturing more people uh with the autism diagnosis than in 1980 when it was just autism and you can see so we've got on our horizontal axis um atypicality to more typical behaviors and we got on the vertical axis uh, level of IQ with the top being, you know, bright and the bottom being um, intellectual disability. They used to call it um, MR, mental retardation. So you can see when they have the DSM-3, the kids, the kids, mostly kids, probably some, some adults, but mostly kids, you know, they were pretty severe and um, quite atypical in order to, to get diagnosed on the autism spectrum. The DSM-3R came, I think, in 1987, and they added PDD and OS, which is pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And that said, yeah, you're not quite autistic, but there's something going on. We'll say, we'll add you right. to the category. And then the DSM-4, I believe, was 1994, and that's when they added the category of Asperger's syndrome. And a lot of people identify as that, you know, they know that it's high functioning autism. That would be the Sheldon. <laughs> that would be the atypical guy. That would be the, uh, the good doctor. And right. yep. And then the, uh, he wrote this chart before the DSM five had come out and the DSM five actually is DSM five. And he, he didn't know what they were going to do. And, um, 
what they actually did was remove the categorical labels and they consider autism a spectrum condition. It, if, you know, from mild to severe, um, IQ high, IQ low, verbal, nonverbal, and they assign different mm -hmm. levels according to how much support you would need. Level one, level two, level three required minimal, moderate, or substantial support. And then some of these these things like NLD, NLD stands for nonverbal learning disability, which is um, kind of a common learning pattern often seen in autism, um, uh, spe uh, specific learning disability. And then BAP is a broad autism phenotype. That means you, you have traits of being on the spectrum, you know, but look, but your atypical behaviors are pretty mild. You're probably yeah. pretty smart, mm, you know, it's, it's that borderline condition. So I, I really just like this as a visual representation representation for people to to see that we are capturing um you know a larger net of people who do have you know autism spectrum conditions as compared right. to 40 years 40 years ago so a brief overview of the dsm criteria i'm sure everybody probably knows a lot of it but you have to have deficits in social emotional reciprocity so you're not having that back and forth social conversation um you're not really mm -hmm. sharing interest in emotions or social affect. Number two, you have that deficits in the nonverbal communicative behaviors. Maybe you're not integrating eye contact uh, with your talking, with your vocalizing. There's some tests on the ADOS that I'm very specifically looking for that and how well can the kids um, combine those two things, three things together. Usually they, they'll do two of the three. They'll give me eye contact and vocalize, but not use gestures. The third thing in this area, in the social communication area, is develop, the difficulties developing and maintaining relationships appropriate to their developmental level. And often the girls can make the friends, but then they have a hard time keeping the friends. And difficulties in imaginative play, which the girls don't always have either. So the girls can look a little different. On this side, we have the restricted repetitive pattern, patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. And um, this often, I think a lot of girls get misdiagnosed with what's called social communication disorder um, because they don't, the professionals feel they don't meet criteria in this area, and they really do. And often, I mean, they so often they don't really have repetitive speech or stereotype speech. They're not flapping their hands. Um, they're not echolalic. They're, you know, they're not spinning the wheels in the cars or anything like that, um, but they are rigid. Um, there mm -hmm. are certain ways they have to do things or they flip out. It's their way or no way. Insistence on the same foods, insistence on the same route, repetitive questioning, um, you know, distress that changes, things like that. So the rigidity is often, you know, one of the, uh, I need two of the following here. Usually it's sensory issues and rigidity. Um, if mm -hmm. it's not very clear and they're not flapping, tail walking, spinning, things like that. And that can really, when you look at, you know, um, struggles with routine change and everything and, and just resistance to change. Now that doesn't mean, Hey, I rearranged your room and you're freaking out. Right. That can mean my daughter decided she wanted to eat Chick-fil-A today. Didn't communicate it to me. Didn't have a discussion. I never said I was doing it, but she put it in her head that she wanted this. And now we can't eat anything else. And the very fact that I gave her like pizza for lunch well here she is crying and refusing to eat and, and falling apart for 35 minutes because it was a change that she didn't she didn't expect this and she put this in her head and it, it's it's a whole thing <laughs> and this happens frequently i know and that's why they get mislabeled odd oppositional defiant you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. yep and uh, we do have to you know, there is a criteria that the symptoms must be present in early childhood. However, um, I like that they added this. It may not be fully manifested until the social demands ex exceed their limited capacities. And that usually happens or often, again, there, you know, this is all general. There's a lot of exceptions, but that usually happens around sixth grade, puberty, middle school, age 12, when the rest of their peers are moving on to makeup and boys and um, social media and things like that. And they're not, and they're stuck. Yeah. Here. They're still over here. Just wanting to watch documentaries and play with Barbies or even, you know, watching Paw Patrol and, and yeah. Um, right. Playing with the like, 
holding yeah. their stuffies, sleeping with their stuffies, mm-hmm. with their parents, things like that. And yeah, the, yeah, the hypo hack or hyperactivity sensory input is um, there's always sensory stuff going on. Um, um, sometimes it's just excessive sensory seeking. A lot of times it's um, sensory avoidance. Mm-hmm. And and then it has to, of course, limit and impair your functioning. And the DSM has done it. The, the number five did a great job of noting, hey, we're probably not really recognizing all of the girls because um, if they're not intellectually impaired and they're not language delayed, probably we're going to miss them because it's just more subtle. Okay. So the question, you know, are females, what's going on? Why are we missing females, right? Um, Are females protected from ASD? So there's some studies to suggest that there might be a protective effect, like the the female protective effect. Let me read this. Um, In the 1980s, there was a researcher at the University of Michigan, Luke Thai. He found that autistic girls have more relatives with autism or other language impairments on average than do boys with autism, which suggests that maybe girls need to inherit more factors related to autism than boys to show traits of it. And there's other large scale studies that support that. One study found that the younger siblings of autistic girls are more likely to have the um, condition of autism than the younger siblings of autistic boys. So other studies suggest that the girls are more resistant to mutations linked to autism than boys so that they carry the same um, mutations, but, but they're not diagnosed as being autistic. And the question is, you know, is this really a protective effect or is this diagnostic bias? Um, the other thing is that uh, the big thing, huge thing, I think probably the most important thing is that professionals and parents, but mostly professionals are, are just unaware of the female autism phenotype um, or even just more subtle manifestations of autism that you might see in a, in a high functioning male that has been missed also. also. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Amy Clinton, she's at Yale. Um, she has referred to females as research orphans because there's, you know, most of the research has been done on males and we're comparing females to the male diagnostic criteria. And right. we're not comparing females to the female diagnostic criteria at all. Because there's not much of a female. Because there's not, not much. The no, and you know, and I, I actually, I did, I did a presentation for CARD on this topic five years ago and the literature has changed very little in that time, which is pretty sad. So what else is going on? So we've got female, maybe female protective effect. Um, uh, You know, we're not recognizing it as much. And then um, what's happening is that females are compensating and masking better than boys. They've learned, they watch and they learn. They don't want to be excluded. They're a little more likely to want to try to fit in. They tend to mimic social behaviors. They learn phrases. They learn scripts. They learn jokes. They follow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so, and likely this is due to sociocultural factors, gender expectations, and, and, you know, socialization found in our society. And, but men do this too. So it's, it's not completely exclusive to women. It's just, you know, some individual differences in how people cope. So I think the higher the IQ, the, the more they tend to, to mask a lot to do with what is expected of females and you know from the beginning of time across every single culture women are expected to be good hosts welcoming social supporting the men you know that they're behind this and that and how do you do that by being likable and then there's there's this thing called diagnostic overshadowing or diagnostic substitution and in, and in, in sex or gender bias based on the diagnostic criteria, because males tend to be more aggressive, they tend to be more externalizing, they're identified more easily because of that. Whereas females are more anxious, they get labeled depressed, they get labeled borderline personality disorder, they get labeled as having OCD. And um, this was a shocking statistic that. Um, Autistic females are three times more likely than non-autistic females to commit suicide as adults, especially if they're bright, um, they're engaging in self-harming, they're engaging in in camouflaging behaviors, and they don't have a lot of resources. So that's a really sobering statistic. But it makes sense because, you know, it's saying, okay, well, if they're bright. So we're talking about smart girls. Yeah. So you're very aware of how different you are. You're very aware of how unaccepted you are. 
Right. Um, but if you're not acting out, you're not aggressive, you're fitting in, you, you, you know, you think you're doing what's socially appropriate. You're internalizing. Female. Yeah. You, you're, you're not picked up. You're not identified. Um, some more sex and gender differences. Dean et al. did a study. They looked, they were watching kids play in the playground, boys and girls. And um, the girls tended to, they really didn't interact with the peers. They didn't engage, but they went near. <laughs> and they maybe followed around or they hung out <laughs> nearby. Kind of like the little girl in the swing there, you know. Whereas the boys just went off and played on their own. So we have to look at, is this typical social communication or not? Like my son will come up and put his arm around anybody. And I mean, it's just, it's nice. It's sweet, but it's inappropriate. And, yeah. so, you know, same thing with like eye contact. It's not as atypical in girls, but it is a little bit unusual. Um, it's usually a little bit reduced. Sometimes it's a little bit too much. Um, yeah. You know, girls tend to have um, minimal or unusual repetitive behaviors in public, but then they go home and they are, picking their nails, maybe pulling out their eyebrows, eyelashes, mm -hmm. uh, picking yeah. their hair, engaging in some self-harm. There's something going on um, that, that they're doing at home to relieve the stress from trying to hold it in while they're out in public. Right. And, mm -hmm. and they tend to be more, more quiet in public at home too, because they're aware. But it's definitely something to pay attention to when you're at home, if they're doing this and you see that they're only doing this at home, like that's, Right. Because what happens is people come in and, you know, the teacher report will be perfect and they're, they're an angel in school and they're not having any problem. But the parents are like, I, I don't know what's going on. They're just crazy. They come home, they're crying, you know, they're inconsolable. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes sense. Everything overwhelms them. They're screaming. They start getting violent, you know, things like that. And then those girls end up just being diagnosed with ADHD or ODD. Or bipolar. And, yeah. Or bipolar instead of looking at a root right, right, right. thing here right yeah. and the other one of the other major differences is um you know like i said girls tend to be a little bit more rigid uh, it, they do tend to have restricted interests but they they're uh, they're normal for girls they're normal mm -hmm. in content singers celebrity yeah. music hair um anime uh, you know um literature yeah. movies it's just abnormal in its intensity so to sum it, of the, the female autism phenotype, they do, they want to engage. It's just inappropriate. There's a lot more social masking to compensate and to camouflage. Um, they, they do have more typical socially focused um, stereotyped interests. The be repetitive or unusual behaviors um, are not seen in public. They tend to happen at home or in private. And there's a much higher likelihood of internalizing disorders, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, self-harm, and even suicide attempts for adults. And it tends to be misdiagnosed with, well, you know, it, other diagnoses may be appropriate, ADHD, anxiety, depression in particular, mm -hmm. um, but that's not often the only thing that's going on. So I, I liked this, um, and I can't tell you where I got it from unfortunately i wish i could reference it but it, the prolonged social rejection cycle when using camouflage if you're really good at using camouflage you know you blend in maybe you get the job you can get the relationships but what happens is there's a dissonance between your true self and, and the self that you're projecting to others um other people are assuming that you're competent socially and you don't have any problems and you're getting stuff done and what happens is you do it okay for a while and then you fail and you don't have the supports in place because you haven't been identified and then right. you're anxious and you're depressed. Whereas if you're not um, camouflaging, you're, you're not fitting in as well, it's more obvious that you're struggling, then this is a, vis a visible disability that will get you access to supports and resources and, um, and I mean, unfortunately, it'll, it'll be more, more quick to see that you're socially rejected, but uh, you know, we, we, we need to see that so we can get you some, some help. Right. Okay. Okay. So the cost of social cam camouflage is talking about that. It's, it's, as you mentioned, it's exhausting wearing mm. the mask. Um, especially in the workplace or at school, these are kiddos who tend to be blunt. <laughs> They're not. Yeah. They're missing the cognitive empathetic cues, literal thinking, such as, you know, the teacher says, 
uh, you, you notice is that there, she's not paying attention. You know, young lady, is this assignment boring? <laughs> Expecting, she'll say, oh, no, ma'am. And she's like, yes, it is. And <laughs> you get punished for that because that's yep. not the expected response, right? right. Um, you, you need clearly um, defined explanations. You struggle with transitions. You, you, you know, struggle with changing your adherence to how you think things should go. You're not getting all the social cues and, and particularly in a work setting, that's not going to lead to any type of success for you. And they're mm -hmm. thinking you're a problematic uh, worker or a student and they're not mm -hmm. thinking it's autism. Yeah. So, so, you know, the other costs, um, identity concerns, because they don't know who they are. They're constantly pretending to be somebody else. And, you know, nobody likes who they are and nobody likes the person that they're pretending to be. Maybe, um, yeah. it's, it's, it's really, it's really hard. You just can't be yourself because you know, that's not going to work. You just don't fit in that way. And then, you know, we get misdiagnosis and miss diagnosis and as a result since we're not accurately diagnosing we're not able to act to meet their needs educationally with mental health um with sensory with friendships with employment and and um with sexual and romantic relationships we not only need to teach sex ed at, you know as to what happens when you know this is this is what it is but you need to to teach the the social uh, norms and rules surrounding that. So when someone says, Hey, you want to come over for Netflix and chill, you know, that probably you need to know what that means, <laughs> <laughs> right? That it's, they probably, it's probably way just, more than that. Or just simple things, you know, someone going, Oh, Hey, you want to get out of here. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, sure, they're right. trying, yeah. you know, that's, that's an attempt to, to, Hey, let's go, you know, let's go be alone somewhere. Let's, right. let's make more happen here. But right. as an autistic female, you're going, sure. Should we go? Like, yes. yeah, there's a struggle. Well, as a result, there, autistic females are at a much higher likelihood of being victimized, um, raped, abused, um, even getting into mm -hmm. domestic violence situations, things like that. Yeah. So let's see. So if we do not diagnose correctly, you know, when they're younger, they have school difficulties, but it's, it's not so, it's not so obvious. The older girls tend to either they're ignored or they tend to, to get mothered. You know, it's a little more apparent in adolescence when we, we start getting the anxiety, the depression, maybe some eating disorder symptoms, maybe some ADHD symptoms, maybe some learning problems, maybe some truancy. And then if you're not identifying this by the time they're adult, again, that's when we what we talked about, they're more vulnerable to exploitation by others, by employers, by men. And one of the statistics that I, I was shocked to find today that 85% um, of college graduates with autism are unemployed. And that's a shocking statistic, a very sobering statistic. And, you know, I think because we, we're not teaching them the right things that they need to know. You the know. social etiquettes. Mm -hmm, exactly. Exactly. That you need. Your employers think yeah. they're rude or yeah. Um, yeah. Just a, kind of a related sidebar. If you're uh, attending the conference, Dr. Amy um, Fritz Ocock is a speech and language therapist and she's giving a talk on um, autism and I, uh, gender identity, transgender. So there is a lot of evidence that there's a higher prevalence rate of gender dysphoria and transgender along the autistic population compared to the general population. Seven to nine percent are the current F estimates, maybe even higher. There's some guidelines that you can check out there. And that um, women with autism do have a higher propensity to be asexual, gay, or bisexual than um, someone without autism. So as, a, as an assessor, you know, we really do need some girl-specific standardized measures. It's all been standardized <laughs> on men or, you know, not really considering female-specific phenotype or subtle high fun uh, functioning. And these are some of the things that are more likely to happen with girls or more likely to avoid demands. And probably a lot of people have heard about pathological demand avoidance. They're more mm -hmm. likely to be careless or overly meticulous with their dress. So they, yeah, th I think your daughters probably <laughs> might fit into, yeah, yeah one, yes. or, one or other of those categories. Yep. One tends to look like she's homeless all the time. And the other one is so meticulous that right. she makes us late every time we leave the house. <laughs> 
tend to interact mostly with younger kids because um, they're easier to control, I think, and boss around. They're more likely to speak in a high-pitched or baby bo baby talk, uh, childish voice. And, you know, if that's happening, if the baby talk is happening five and older, um, it's a red flag. I'd probably get an evaluation. It shouldn't be. Um, if your child is, you know, seven or eight and they're still hiding behind you, uh, you know, I would I wonder about social anxiety, things like that. That might be associated with autism. If they are selectively mute in situations um, outside of the home, or even when, even with grandparents or things like that, I would I would assess for autism. Um, girls are often described to me as very determined. They're very persistent. They get what they want. She's going to be a great leader. Mm -hmm. She's going to make a great CEO of the company someday because you know. She knows what she wants and she gets it and she's persistent and she doesn't quit. And a lot of that is the repetitiveness and the rigidity. And um, the, I, I'm not going to take no for an answer because I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I'm going to keep on getting it and I'm keep on you till I get it. Right. Uh, yeah. The girls are more likely to have self-care problems, difficulties with hygiene, showers, you know, and that involves a lot of transitions. Uh, to take a shower, you have to take off your clothes. <laughs> you have to get into the hot or cold water. You have to do a lot of stuff. There's there's orders and um, methods. Then you have to get out. And there's transitions to the cold. And then there's textures. A lot of sensory out. input. There's yeah. so much sensory stuff involved in, in, in hygiene tasks. Brushing your teeth, washing your face. It, sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't mean wiping, bowel movement. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a big thing. I recommend, yeah. I recommend bidets a lot. Yeah. To, because so many kids have issues with wiping. Mm -hmm. um, um, girls tend to act a lot like cats or dogs or horses. And um, I'm, I'm not um, surprised when I get neighed at or I, the, and I'll ask a question and they will answer with a meow or a bark. And it's not always, yeah. a lot of times it's voice, but it tends to be more subtle. Um, but it is, My dog people. yeah, it, but it is an unusual <laughs> method of social communication. And again, <laughs> and again, they tend to have intense, but typical interests. Fantasy, anime, horses, cats, pop stars. So nothing super unusual, but more intense than you would think it would be. So, you know, for professionals, um, they consider that this might be happening. Refer. There's no harm in an evaluation. Um, the girls tend to struggle more during adolescence, and we do need to compare them to other girls and not the male autism um, uh, phenotypical profile. And consider that girls show different restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. They're not usually so disruptive, especially at school, but they do tend to be quite rigid. So Tanya uh, Marshall is a psychologist over in Australia, and she's written several books, blogs, and she had a list of commonly observed characteristics and traits of girls with autism that I thought I'd kind of write out so that you could you know, if you're a parent watching this and you're wondering, hmm, you know, should I get my girl uh, evaluated? Here's some things to consider. Does she experience tense, rapid emotions? Have you been diagnosed with bipolar? <laughs> um, but particularly yeah. anxiety, an anger, and panic. Emotionally mature compared to peers. Tend to cry. Sensitive, shy, anxious, depressed, passive, avoidant, low self-esteem because, I mean, everything's difficult. And better linguistic abilities develop me. Um, uh, compared to boys. And again, these are generalities. I tend to find that most of my kids on the on the autism spectrum, even though they're high functioning, they do have unusual social communication. So um, they will they will make odd references to topics. They will um, use they will conjugate their verbs unusually. They will flip words and sentences. You will be talking about one thing and they'll say, "Oh yeah, that's you know when we went to the beach and the red tide." was there I you know and mom knows what they're talking about but I'm like um I'm not really sure what's going on or you know I have like a bunch of rocks in the back of my wall and one girl's like oh there's a cave over there you know and I just you know <laughs> I knew that she and I'm she's looking back there I'm like oh if there's a hole in a rock it looked like a cave she started talking about a cave and something else that reminded her of her cave you know so I was following it but if you were trying to have a conversation, you might go, that's kind of weird. You're not on topic. That doesn't make sense. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't follow you. So there's often subtle, subtle, but apparent unusual social communication difficulties. Talking too loud or talking too quiet. 
Either one. Or talking. One. Uh, if, if I ask the kiddo a question and they turn to the mom and say, I don't know, mom, do I like pizza? Or just stare. They just stare. They make like some firm eye contact waiting for mom to answer for them as though they can't answer. Right. Can't. Right. Because there's a lot of anxiety and they don't want to be wrong or say it wrong or, you know, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Tendency to be clingy. Usually there's one single friend. You don't want more than one at a time. There's a lot of jealousy if there is. Sometimes there's a lot of jealousy if mom spends time with the, a new sibling or another sibling. Mm -hmm. Um. We might play with younger kids or adults because there are clear social rules, right? It's not ambiguous. With peers, you don't know what they're going to say. You don't know what they're going to do, but you can kind of- Younger them. children are so non-judgmental mm -hmm. and they're very yeah. honest. Yeah. That's easy to navigate, It is. you know? It is. And so yeah. usually you can kind of sneak by, um, especially if you're homeschooled, until you're a teen. And, you know, like I right. said, a teen, teen years, it's-, it's it's usually a lot more apparent because the rest of the teenagers are moving on and your teen is, is not, or your teen is different or your, yep. your teen is, is struggling more. Um, often, yep. often the girls can make friends and they can have a conversation, but it, it's not maintained, you know? So maybe you have one or two uh, reciprocal exchanges and then they go off on something else. So yeah, it can. <laughs> yeah. But not fully, not not completely. Um, girls tend, do tend to have a better imagination because they tend to use, utilize fantasy a little bit more and, and escape into fiction and pretend play. But sometimes it can be um, scripted. And oftentimes, you know, I get out my little action figures and um, they want to control the play and they want to tell me what to say. And they say, no, you say this or you say this. <laughs> so, and, and again, every kiddo is different, but, but these are the general generalizations. And I tend mm -hmm. to hear almost all the time with girls that girls are more controlling in the play with their beers or bossy <laughs> leader going to play her way. And if the girl doesn't want to play her way, she'll, she'll play by herself or find somebody who will do it. It was usually younger. A lot of girls just, they have common interests. They're common for girls, reading, writing, animals, Disney, theater, languages, poetry, philosophy, technology, fashion, um, politics, but they can go on and on and on. And then, yeah. and then, you know, again, to some, the repetitive and stemming behaviors are there, but they're not obvious. They hide them. They've, they've learned that that's not something that you show people that you do. Um, I see the chewing hair, the swaying, the fidgeting, often there's ticks or just repetitive talking about certain things. Well behaved at school, not so much at home. Rule bound, concerned with justice, social justice, social fairness, um, likes to tattle likes to make sure everyone's following the rules because that's black and white. That makes sense. Okay. If someone's not following the rules, they, they like to tell the teacher and then you get in trouble. And socially that's, that's death for you. Right. Um, we talked about this um, demand avoidance, usually due to anxiety. Oftentimes their facial expressions and emotions do not match the situation or um, uh, maybe, you know, especially a, women, are told that they have resting bitch face. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're just not recognizing when, when your emotions are just not matching what they should be or people, what people are expecting of you to have. Right. right. Yeah. And, and how do you know if you don't know? There are some positives and I want, <laughs> I want you to, there are many positives. Um, all of my favorite people are on the autism spectrum. Uh, it's just, you think out of the box, you, you just, you're not thinking typically, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, right. So you, I won't go through this whole uh, list, but I'll let you guys read that. So um, the DSM diagnosis has changed, and I expect that it's going to change again to be even more inclusive, inclusive of this broader um, autism phenotype that includes more subtle presentations. Girls might be more protected genetically a little bit, although I'm not sure. I think it's probably a diagnostic bias still um, because traditionally girls have been marginalized in research. We don't know. Um, our assessment measures um, are built on male criteria, not girl criteria, female criteria. Girls present differently than boys and um, high functioning boys present a little bit differently than traditional boys. 
and girls and high functioning boys have learned to camouflage and mask their symptoms better. They hide them because that's what works to fit in. And as a result, they end up being diagnosed with other things. Um, so if you have a litany of diagnoses and you don't think that you're adequately capturing what's going on, I would definitely get a second opinion. So as an adult, this is a good article to read the experiences of late diagnosed women with autism spectrum conditions. And if you are an adult and you're wondering if you're on the autism spectrum, um, go to aspytest.org, um, R-A-A-D-S, and um, that's the RIPVO Diagnostic and um, autism and Asperger scale, and it will give you some idea if you might want to pursue an additional diagnosis. And finally, here's additional book resources. I've read all the books. Um, they're, they're, all, they're all good and have um, some merit and, and would be helpful in, you know, helping you determine should you have your daughter assessed? Should you have yourself assessed? Should you have your husband assessed? Yeah. <laughs> Things like that, you know, because um, ultimately it, we don't do any any favors by not diagnosing autism if that's what is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's just, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being on the spectrum at all. No, but it's just, it's so, it's so much more important to have that, um, that definition. You know, I see so many people saying like, oh, well, I don't want to label. I don't want to label. And the way I view it is, when you have a label on food, you know, you, you see the ingredients, you see what's in here, you see the new nutrients, you see all of the things that you need to know about that food. When you have this label on yourself or your child, you can start putting together all those details and go, oh, okay, this is what I have in front of me. Yeah. And, and act accordingly. Yeah. You know, it's so important. Yeah. And so that important. will help, help educators, help you as parents, help them, yeah. their self-esteem, help their nope. identity. Yeah. 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 Every, everyone, everyone, you know, especially the, the older teens and the adults that I, you know, that come in, they're wondering, um, we assess it is, they're grateful. They're happy. They're validated. Um, it's always been a positive um, experience. Right. And I do recommend that every parent tell their child that they're on the spectrum. I have some good videos um, to recommend and books. Um, Alexander Ameline's have a, a video called Amazing Things Happen. That's really good teaching about neurodiversity and how, you know, we need neurodiverse minds. Think, think of all the great minds in history. Albert Einstein, Tesla, Beethoven, Mozart. They're probably on the autism spectrum, you know, yeah. and, and that's why we have all these, all these great creative uh, work. So autism is nothing new. It's been around. It will always be around. Um, I think we will identify it more and more and it's just, it's just going to become more and more commonplace. So we need to figure out how to meet the needs of everybody, but we can't do that until everybody, until you're properly diagnosed. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to help. If anyone has any questions, you can um, text me, email me, go to my website, mindworksite.com. And, and I'm happy to help you out. And I'm sure Lee, you know, she's very, <laughs> very experienced too. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, as a person who has, you know, we're not gonna talk about all the, the people we suspect undiagnosed, but just in my family alone, right. my children, my sister's children, my younger sisters, I've grown up around autistic kids yeah. always. So, yeah. so yeah. we think it's normal and, you know, and, and it, 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 it is, it's fine. It's fine. It's a variation. Yeah. It's a difference it's again. Different. Like I said, I'm curious to see what the DSM-6 will say, a difference or. Yeah. I view it as just a different operating system. You know, That's autistic awesome. people aren't Windows or Mac. They're like a Linux. Right. You know, there's, there's a learning curve to understanding it. But when you get down to the roots, it's so, it's actually so simplistic. It's so easy to operate if you just have an understanding. Well, that's great. And I, yeah, they're, they're honest, they're sweet. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. yeah, I can't, I, you know, if I don't want to know the truth, I don't ask my son something, you know, don't say, yeah. do I look fat in these pants? Because he'll say, yeah, mom. You, mm -hmm. you <laughs> so, but I appreciate that. I appreciate the truth. Right, exactly. So, yeah. Okay. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if we have time for questions or comments. Hopefully we do and, and we can, we can help out with that. Yep. And if not, just um, send us an email and I can mm -hmm. give you a copy of the slides because I don't know that they're fully updated to, to what I um, showed from what's available on the website. So right. just let me know. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you.